this week's edition of the Michigan Bros Grow Show. Our guest this week is Chris from Country Roots Limited. Welcome, Chris. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. What would you like to tell the audience about yourself as part of the introduction? You know that overall, I'm just a passionate guy about organic farming, um, striving to do what I can to learn the best practices, you know, talking to people that know what they're doing and have been doing this stuff for much longer than me, and um, just learning the ways to cultivate and, and grow proper organic plants indoors and outdoors. Did you start in organics or did you come from the synthetic lines first? Um, I basically took right off with uh, organics, but I did dabble with some synthetics in the beginning and um, was in the process of setting up hydro buckets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I uh, was kindly introduced to Chris Trump and his natural farming series, series videos that he has on YouTube. And with my background, it just made so much sense what, what was going on there. And, and I uh, thought that I had to be a part of that for sure. Definitely, so, I like those. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a geologist by trade. So I've been uh, doing environmental work for the last 10 years and just working on various cleanups around Michigan and talking with various people and um, learning about negligent practices of the past. And believe it or not, uh, Michigan farmers have a big problem. Um, they're, they're one of the leading causes of contamination around, you know, just from their agricultural practices and the things that they've done and, and um, shying away from organic methods and, and just having cesspools of junk, you know. And I'm talking big farmers mainly, and so it's kind of sad. And so when I saw this natural farming kick, it made a lot of sense for me to just take part of that and um, try to motivate people to push that route as much as I can because I believe in it. That's really good. I watched those Chris Trump videos and like you, it seems like it's the smart thing to do it. You're just way further ahead than I am. I'm just starting to stick my toe in the water, but yeah. I really do like the way of you're basically not introducing anything into the plant that's not going to be there at the end. I have yeah. this big ass farm that's behind my house. It's like, I don't know, a few hundred acres maybe. And they probably spray it once a month with something. And it really makes you, uh, I don't know, it gets me down on myself trying to grow my little crop in my closet and my, you know, as organically or as clean as possible. Not organically, but I don't spray pesticides on my plants. And, uh, you know, we're all trying to do it better. And it doesn't seem like they have a lot of incentive to do that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's all about these you know, the ease of things now. Everybody's so busy and just trying to get things done. And, you know, we've, we've lost the realm of working the land. You know, our parents and our grandparents tell us stories about working the land and things like that. But it's, it's, gotten, it's gotten fairly sad. And as, as farmers and gardeners, we know that we can't just spray the land in the beginning of the year, plant our crop, maybe come spray it one more time or two more times and then harvest it at the end of the year. Like, I don't know anything that I can grow that simple. You know, it all requires some love and attention as it should. I definitely agree with you on that. So tell the listeners what this farming consists of. Why is this different than synthetics? How is it different? So, you know, with, with current farming practices, basically they till the land and um, spray uh, pesticides and herbicides. So what does that do? It kills off all the microbiology, all the organic content of the of the land is basically killed off and um, you left with a, a desiccate land for the most part. They'll put a little bit of fertilizer on there just enough to establish a root mass for their crops and you know and then spray it from there and keep them going. But without the living biology and without the organics um, being offered and continuously offered through the land throughout the year, um, we're just desiccating our lands and, and that's what's been happening. So. As a result, you know, people's health are declining. You know, everybody's got gut health issues now. You know, why do we think that is? You know, I, I think it has a lot to do with what we're all eating. Um, it should be anyways, you know, it all goes to our gut. So, you know, just, we all need a proper balance of probiotics and mycorrhizae and, you know, these beneficial life forms on the land. And uh, many farmers are just not catering to that life form anymore. So. 
is it up to the big farmers or is it up to the small farmers? You know, and I kind of believe that the small farmers, we can all plant something in our yards and, um, and lead by example that way. And the big farmers will just continuously catch on is the way I see it. They have to. And I believe they already are. You know, there's, there's a lot more discussion of organics in general now. Uh, I was pleased to be part of the Small Farmers Conference in Michigan. That's up in Traverse City. I'll be going there again this year. And there's like hardly any cannabis farmers. It's all regular farmers. And, and, the, and there was hundreds of people there. And the whole goal of it was sustainable organic gardening practices. And they had like 100 speakers, 20 different talk rooms. It's a pretty cool event. And um, so it's good to see people talking about that. It's good to have these conversations and see this stuff spread. And that's my goal, you know, is to just be a voice in this industry. What's the name of that conference in Traverse City? It's called the Small Farmers Conference. And it's probably going to be coming up in February this year. That's when it was last year. I'll definitely be going again. <laughs> it's, at the Grand, it's at the Grand Traverse Hotel, too. So it's, nice, it's nice. Getaway. Yeah. yeah. It'd be nice to see more cannabis representation there, you know, because we do have a voice in this community now. There's a lot of cannabis farmers in Michigan now. Yeah. But it isn't growing. I was, growing. The, I was the only one that had a booth at this event and openly posted, I am a cannabis farmer in front of everybody. And people were amazed. They came around and believe me, everybody was talking to me and they were all curious about what I had going on. But yeah, I'm a, you know, I'm a licensed hemp farmer and, and I grow some cannabis for, for my medicine and, and for some of my patients medicine. I guess this is a really good junction into asking you uh, what you're growing and how you're doing that. You said hemp first, so let's ask you about hemp. We haven't had any, any hemp people on the show so far. So I think our viewers might be pretty interested in that. Yeah. I, uh, I was late to the hemp program this year. Um, I kind of let some of my other friends get it and was seeing what they were doing and see what kind of plant, plants were around and um, I decided uh, in, at the end of June I would apply for my license and so I, pl I put a license in and I, I planted an acre spot and just decided to you know throw out 50 plants and see what they all look like and what they do and just learn something about hemp and, and I got a use for the medicine you know I'm not going to just wholesale this out I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it properly just like any other plant. Um, so I'm not a huge hemp farmer at the moment. Right now, we'll be just making some craft medicines for us. But by I mean, next I, year, that's, by next that's year, we'll be talking to right all of our listeners. If they're going to be growing hemp, they're going to grow an acre of it. They're not. Yeah, gonna, yeah, and yeah. I mean, it's a little bit confusing because you have to apply for a license to grow hemp, but or they consider it in your plant counts, I believe. You know, like cause we can all grow twelve plants supposedly. So I don't know. I believe. But with federal regulations, I would hope to see it separated at one point that you could grow your 12 plants and then maybe you could have 12 more hemp plants or something and you don't have to get a special license for it or nothing. You know, that would be great. Now, I noticed on your Instagram that you make a 15% CBD tincture. So yeah. is that what you're going to plan to do with some of these hemp plants is to run it as tincture for medicine? Yep. Uh, tinctures, honeys. Um, Tinctures and honeys are going to be really big for me because you can you can use them in all your cooking practices. It's, it's easy to infuse them in just about anything you want to eat. You can put it in your coffee or your tea in the morning. Um, you know, I also do brewing, so I want to make some like CBD ciders. I, I got a CBD cider going right now and I'll make a CBD beer. So, you know, it's just a good way to incorporate that. And I guess I'll, I'll segue into that, that I've been brewing longer than I've been growing. And so when I learned that I could brew my own inputs, it was amazing to me. That was really exciting to me. And so I've just incorporated my brewing practices and, you know, learning about all these beneficial plants and all these ancient herbs and medicines that people used to use and used to rely on in their gardening practices and, and incorporate them into mine. Because, you know, we have to believe that between all the organics, the minerals, and the elements of nature, that's everything a plant needs. There's no reason for synthetics if you can balance those inputs properly. You know, we should definitely be able to grow anything better than, you know, any other way if we, if we balance the proper organics and minerals. So being a geologist and a brewer and a knack for farming, it makes a lot of sense for me to do what I do. 
for sure, man. I'm definitely down with the teas, and I noticed that you have a Vortex Brewer as well. I love those. And then speaking of the brewing thing, I took a page out of the Brewer's book by getting a mash bag. And oh, I yeah. use a large mash bag, and I put it in my 10-gallon Vortex Brewer, and I just let all of the amendments just kind of float around there and compost. Perfect. And and that way I don't have to worry about any kind of contamination. And it's definitely reusable. It was like 10 bucks, man. Definitely something to get. Yeah. Yep. And that's the benefit, you know, with our store, we're a natural farming store. Country Roots is a natural farming store and a brewing store. So half of our business is brewing supplies and half of our business is the minerals and organics that people need for gardening. So the two industries cross paths pretty well. I noticed that a lot of people are interested in both. And, and like you say, a lot of people are incorporating grains and rice hulls and various things into their gardening anyway. So it's pretty cool. I definitely do. Well, the rice holes are nice because you not only get aeration, you also get it that it breaks down into silica over time into your bed. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, people are mixed in, uh, you know, it's like these perlite heavy soils. You know, I always tell people, hey, you know, put a little bit of oats and some rice hulls and some natural uh, quartz rock in there or something, you know, just some busted up granite pieces. You know, there's no need for perlite. You can, I mean, per, a little bit of perlite's fine, but we all know that it just doesn't break down too well in nature. So I hate opening a bag of soil and seeing it, you know, approximately 50% perlite. I'm like, ugh, but like that's me. <laughs> six years ago, my backyard was full of perlite from dumping so many excess seven gallons outside, man. I, my wife was not very happy with me. She was like, dude, what are we going to do about this backyard, man? <laughs> yeah, I'll eventually just rake it up, I guess, and throw it in the trash. But yeah, it, um, it's a pleasure. So, you know, I got a, Basically, I set up a 24 by 36 spot for my uh, hemp plants. I got nice spacing on them. They're all looking really beautiful. They're all still going strong. A lot of Michigan farmers are already pulling their plants down. Um, you know, I attribute to being in a really well-balanced soil on a crap or natural regimen. The plants can, they have much more resilience, you know, and they can last through the brutal lane that we had last week. My plants are doing fine. You know, my plants are not all molded out and they're all still going. <laughs> so, you know, I attribute it to natural farming, not necessarily anything that I do, just stick with the program. You're I know that working all, with nature. Yeah, all the people on our panel, we all started pulling up all of our outdoor plants when it started raining, you know. It's tough, you know, I pulled a few of them. I won't lie, not, I didn't pull any of my hemp plants, but, um, a few of my cannabis plants, a few smaller ones. We're all getting light on smoke, so I definitely need some dry this weekend. Um, but for the most part, I'm definitely still going strong. I'm very pleased. I'm, I'm worried that it looks like four more days at, of rain at the end of next week. It's like, man, you know, I don't know if I want to endure another four days of hard rain or not, but we'll find out when that gets here. Yeah, if they look healthy going into it, they'll probably go out of it just fine. Yeah, you know, people, you got to know the signs, like you start seeing, um, the, if, if like your pistols start going black, that's the first sign that they're going to mold. So watch your pistols and make sure they're still white or amber. And if, it, if anything starts going black, usually it's lower ones or the tops or something like that, then you know you got to pull it. That's the pre-sign that something bad is going to happen. Or if you see spontaneously, suddenly dead leaves, like they're yellow, look at the yeah. bud where the leaf meets the bud, usually you've got some rot starting there. Or some brown spots. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Botrytis. Yep. It sucks. It's weird when you come out, like if you find a slimy one, it's like, how the hell did that bud turn slimy? In a day. <laughs> yeah, just boom. Yeah, just I'm a garbage. garbage. I check my plants every single day and I, I went out and I was like, oh cool, I'm like a bud rot right here. Yep, that's right now I'm, I'm making a round morning and night for sure. And, my wife helps me too, bless her soul. So I'm not out there by myself. I got her keeping an eye out on things with me. Old man on our on our panel jokes about sleeping with his plants at the end of the season to make sure nobody rips them and to watch for a PM and uh, bud rot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and the rippers too. You know, I'll, I've known, I've been hearing stories, but I can say four people really close to me got ripped, and it was all separate situations, different areas. And it's heartbreaking, man. It's it's really heartbreaking. I really, you know, it's, with the legalities and everything, I hope that this will slow down and people will just learn that they can just get some plants of their own. But I think we all have an idea that it's, a lot of times it's kids. So 
not necessarily kids, but younger people that don't have much. Right, and it, it's easier, right? Than uh, putting in the time and watching shows and uh, learning about natural farming or learning any method and actually growing the plant. It's not yeah. as easy as growing a weed like everybody likes to say it is. Yeah, and that's a big thing too, is just all these hemp farmers is, you know, some of these guys, like I said, I set up a small project, you know, and that my project this summer is by far bigger than any project I've ever done. So what, what right did I have to try to set up five acres of hemp and think that I could successfully get through that? Like I got to work my way up to that. And some of these guys are just getting way over their head and, you know, where first thing is where are you going to dry it? Because we all know that you can have a great plant in the end, but if you can't dry it properly, you're screwed. So well, who's going to trim five acres too? Now let's let's not get shortcutting on that. The trimming is the killer. Yeah, exactly. How are you going to trim it and properly dry it? People are talking about running it through combines and bailing it up. It's like, what are you going to do with that? You better just make clothing out of it or rope or something. But, but. <laughs> I think a lot of the big CBD farms, hemp farms, are processing right straight into just CBD oil. And then the smaller ones up here right now, like one acre farms like yours are focusing on hemp flour. Yep, that's, yeah, I'm going for quality flour and then I'll just be able to turn that down to, you know, like I say, tinctures and honeys for the most part that are easy to infuse. And we'll smoke some of the flour. I, I'm encouraging a couple of people around me to quit smoking cigarettes. And so I'm like, hey, I can uh, give you a great deal on a pound of hemp and you can quit smoking cigarettes maybe. That's a good idea. And I really like, um, since cannabis now is so strong, I like mixing it with hemp. Yeah. Yeah, See, I smoke. I like saying too, like I like starting my day with CBD and ending my day with CBD. That's fine with me. So what are you getting that 15% CBD from? Um, that's a flower that's tested. The 15%, it was a flower that was went into that tincture was at 15%. And so the next step now will be to have these tinctures that we make tested. But right, I got, we, we just made some honey. We made some tinctures. We got a few things. So once I get a couple things made up, I'll, I'll send them to the lab and we'll get all those tested. See exactly, you know, how, how the ratios come out once it's done. Are those glycerin or alcohol tinctures? Um, glycerin. Yep. Glycerin and um, Michigan honeys. Using... I know some other farmers, so just sourcing raw Michigan honey. But yeah, it's been a fun summer. I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's been, it's been a stressful summer for a lot of us, but I've, I've really enjoyed it. I'm very passionate to just keep moving forward. And, you know, we've, we've, this was the first year of us having a storefront. So we've been gardening and talking about this message for a couple of years now, but we just decided to take the leap and start a storefront of our own. And, um, have a location for people to come and get the things and talk about things like this and um, just keep moving forward. We also do soil and water testing so we can, you know, help you build a soil profile. And it's nice because I got a whole bunch of data on hand now, so I'm able to kind of see what the good growers ratios are and kind of nudge people in the right direction on some of the analytes you're missing because, you know, we need to make sure our MPKs and our organics and you know, we don't want to make sure, we also want to make sure that not too many metals or contaminants are building up in your soil too. So, but, you know, there's always a few things you could do to tweak it in the right direction, especially for, you know, if you're relying on uh, an entire summer's crop on your, on the, on the ground that you're using, you know, it's, it's worth a $65 test. Actually, well, so I think soil is 55 bucks. You talk about heavy metals and we were talking about hemp and yesterday I was reading an article on the differences between like if you get a hemp CBD product in America versus the cheap <clears throat> Chinese crude oil that's not tested with heavy metals and everything else. And I feel like there's a bit of a learning uh, gap between people that are, you know, jumping on the CBD bandwagon and then where they're sourcing. It's kind of like saying, oh, I smoke cannabis now, but you're just... You know, you're getting the, the Mexican bricks from back in the day. Yeah, it is. But what kind of medicine's in that? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, us growers, we get picky, too, because we know what it takes. And so you see something that you're not exactly pleased with. And, and I, I know we've all seen some stuff that we look at with crooked eyes. And, you know, I'm seeing, like, some black flowers on the counters in gas stations. And I'm like, what is that? It's black. <laughs> you know, and then uh, some of these gummies and uh, little... Bait pens or whatever it's 
what is it? I don't know, but it'll be nice. You know, that's why like we haven't rushed to go out and source any of that stuff ourselves because we trust that plenty of Michigan farmers are going to have quality products. You know, I may not have a huge hemp garden, but I, I know some people that have bigger ones than me and I'm, I'd much rather support, you know, their business than some Chinese business, you know. You were talking about your store real quick. I wanted to go back to that and mention that you sell predatory mites and um, other stuff like that. And that's a good thing for Michigan growers to know because I didn't know that. And uh, I would have been looking on Amazon. So now I know somewhere to look. And I think yeah. it's important that our viewers know that there's somewhere here that we can get predatory mites overnight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, especially if you talk to me, set up an order at the end of the week for, because it's, it's best for us to know by Monday so that we can work with it and, and get it done. Um, it's hard for uh, people to come to me on Wednesday or Thursday and inspect it on Friday. I'm like, eh, maybe, you know. But yeah, we, uh, we keep a lot of bugs in hand and uh, we've been supplying a lot of people. We also have some pest management programs. Um, so people always ask, you know, how do you use beneficial insects and sprays? Um, you know, there's absolutely a way we don't use anything too invasive of a spray. You know, we use um, sprays that really just sort of deter bugs, you know, rather than kill them full on, you know. Um, it's all about keeping the plants healthy. As long as the plants are healthy and everything's moving fine, you know, the, everything's usually pretty good. And the plants don't mind having beneficial insects on them at all. It doesn't, it doesn't make them upset one bit. So just working understanding that you know when you go into a flower program maybe you need to have a good foliar program right at the beginning make sure your plants are nice and healthy because it is good to foliar them as well too and then as you start flowering you know you got to stop foliaring of course so then you, you definitely want to have a few beneficial insects around so that you can sleep at night and not have to worry about things taking over your garden so are you talking about like rosemary oil and maybe the sulfur and things like that to be used as a foliar spray yeah, I make a, we make a pest management spray here that has garlic, clover, rosemary, lemon, lime, lemon grass, and garlic in it. And, um, you know, it's just some deterrent type stuff. And uh, so that's what I pretty much use as a foyer program. And that also, if I use anything else, I like using um, um, a neem product from Terra Neem. And I'm, there is some debate on neem, and I will definitely say that I'm aware of the debate of neem, but if you use it properly and have a good quality neem, what I do with the neem is I mix it with our IPM, and it makes sort of like a neem tonic. And I use it, like I say, at the end of your veg cycle and going into flower, you want to make sure that you have your plants full on healthy. And so that's when I'm heavier on my foliage program using a neem tonic. And then after that, I'm just running beneficial insects from there. And we've been very successful. I've, you know, it's, it's amazing how, you know, we've helped a lot of people. A lot of people are, you know, I've been hesitant to, you know, do various things, but once they move in, everybody's very happy with, you know, what's going on here. Well, I think Michigan growers, a lot of caregivers and stuff are getting their products tested more and more often. So they're looking for organic ways to control pests, so like, like we're talking about right here. I might be a synthetic grower, but I can't rely on pesticides reliably anymore when I got to do these expensive tests and potentially get my whole crops rejected. Yeah. You know, it's really nice to have that ability to go to you and ask you uh, for those things. Yeah, I mean, even in synthetics, you, you know, absolutely you can still use beneficial insects. Just, um, I will say too, you know, with, uh, with the synthetic growing, I always want to say, point out that I don't have a bias towards the industry. First and foremost, I believe that, you know, if you just stick to a proper regimen and know how to get that clean outcome in the end, that, that's first and foremost, most important. So, um, you know, everybody has a program. I have some friends that do synthetics and, and I trade flower with them all the time and I love it. You know, it's, it, I'm not opposed to it at all. I just... It's all about quality in your in your work, you know. Have pride in your work. Don't, don't worry, I uh, I bash the salty, shitty synthetic growers too. <laughs> I I used to be one of those guys. I had to learn from that. Yeah, you know, it's like you want to. We all want to optimize what we're doing. There's no doubt about it, you know. And so it's hard to set yourself back. And if people say you can pump this atom and it's going to do this, and 
And yeah, I've seen some crazy buds, you know, on synthetics where they could just grow, 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 grow. They just don't stop growing. And yeah, that's cool. But I don't know. Find a balance. Keep a proper rotation. Have a cycle. Have you know, if if you really want to have um, you know regular medicines coming at you, then you got to have a couple rooms. You know, you got to have a bed spot, a flower spot, and you could run an eight, ten week program and just stick with it. I've always just been like, hey man, just grow your own. I don't care how you do it, you know, whether you do it through hydroponics or whether you do it through organic or whatever, it doesn't matter how you grow your own medicine. But I feel like that like that might be the most important thing for you to start if you really think about it. In pre-show, we were talking about this and Sequence had made a great statement about what bad growers should do. I don't remember what I said. Oh yeah, I said, oh yeah. So I was talking to a friend of mine and uh, we were going over a room and I was explaining all the effort it takes to be a good grower and stuff. And he was kind of asking me for shortcuts and things like that. And uh, said, bad growers should just buy their cannabis. <laughs> oh, <laughs> was, yeah. Is that yeah. what I said? Is that how I phrased it? Was, it, was like, I it was like uh, talking about, I think it was lazy growers. We're talking about what the best way that lazy growers can spend their money is to oh, just yeah. buy cannabis instead exactly. of trying to just explode their own shit. Yeah, or just give up on the indoors and set yourself up a little outdoor structure because it's easier outside. Just set yourself up a little something, get on a little program. I get people coming in our store with $20 budgets, $10 budgets all the time. They just got to plant the ground. It starts flowering. They want something to feed it. Well, here you go. <laughs> so where is that storefront located? Because somebody listening is going, okay, look, Chris, I, you, I'm sold already. I want to come see you. I want to talk to you. I want to buy some product from you. Where do they go? We're in Duego. West Michigan, so pretty nice location between Grand Rapids and the northern community. And um, I chose this spot just because I, I didn't want to be in the city. <laughs> but we're all, we also have a website, countryrootsltd.com, and um, you know, we're always talking to people there and you know try to point people in the right directions. I do my best I can to keep up with the, with, keep up with the demand and the questions coming in. Yeah, I've been browsing your website the whole time we've been talking. It's really interesting, all the stuff you have on there. It's a really well put together, well put together website. So uh, good job on that. Thank you. That's something else I did myself. I was a project that I didn't anticipate having to do necessarily, but you, it's not too bad. Getting it started is the hardest thing, that's for sure. It's a lot of work getting it running, but once you got some things on there, you get five things on there, then it's just adding things from there. <laughs> But yeah, um, what kind of genetics, you guys, I guess it's something that I like to talk about too is genetics, um, being that you guys talk to a lot of people, you know, Michigan and running strains, these strains come from all over the place and it's funny running some of these strains, like I got a few of them that, you know, are maybe mid flower right now and it's like, wow, you know, that's, that's a strain I definitely don't want to grow again as fun as it is to watch. But um, learning about good strains in Michigan. Um, my crescendo that I grew outside this year, it's not from a Michigan breeder, but it flowered really early. Mm -hmm. So it finished early. It's already done. I was really excited about that. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's because I think it started flowering when we were at like 13 and a half hours of daylight. So instead yeah. of it at being at 12, it got to start quicker. Um, so it got like a head start above even quicker flowering plants, you know, normally shorter day plants. So it really had an advantage there. So I'm going to look into that more when I'm yeah. genetics going forward. For sure. Yeah, that's, that's a big part of my um, overall research as a grower, I guess. It's just, you know, I love growing them outside. It's fun. I do it indoors as well, but outside is, is, a, is a real joy because especially as a natural farmer, I get full privilege to just let them do their thing. Um, but yeah, learning the good ones and, um, I do a little bit of breeding myself and so I'm kind of hoping over, over time that some of my own breed lines will just inherently be the strongest genetics I have, you know, in, in my climate or in my region. If they're surviving over time in your region, they're going to be, you're going to, um, it shows that they're tolerant to all of your own conditions so that your seed stock will be good for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's an interesting part of it, but. I have some of my plants that are definitely a lot further along than others. I noticed that um, 
you know, some of the cookie plants, I guess, they, they dense up a little faster than other plants, so they tend to finish a little faster. But. That crescendo is a cookie's cross. Yeah. Um, and then uh, with hemp, it was interesting. I, I uh, did some auto flowering hemp. And I put them out in July and I didn't realize, you know, think about the fact that they're an autoflower. It, it doesn't really matter what the light cycle was. So they didn't start flowering until later too. So, but I know some people that are doing two crops a year now on, in the summer with some of these auto strains. And that's pretty interesting as well. Yeah, that's something I'm going to actually try next year is doing two crops of autos. Yeah. Yeah, how that goes, yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Um, it's, like I said, that's why I brought up the seeds aspect or just the genetics. You know, I'm, I'm in, I really enjoy seeing what Michigan farmers do. You know, a lot of us have been watching people in Northern California and Oregon and stuff for the last 10 years. And, and we know some people in Michigan that are, you know, the OGs in the game, but... Um, now they can be public. Yeah, exactly. That's great. You know, I got my influencers for sure. But, you know, it's fun to see us open in Michigan and being able to do this. And, and we're doing it really well, I think. You know, I'm actually pretty proud of the community. It's, it was a rough summer and, and it was a bummer to get this hard of a rain at the end and see people suffering there. But I think people are doing pretty well though. Skilbo is connected to a lot of Michigan breeders that he could uh, point you to. Okay. What, what I would say is, I'll just to name one, is Silver Squirrel Farms is located in the UP. And he runs his stuff outdoors as well. So my thinking is, hey, if this dude's running it in a more northern latitude than me, why wouldn't I want to try to maybe roll the dice, snatch a pack up, and try running them where I'm at? Rather than going for something that they're flowering out in, I don't know, let's say Southern California. Yeah, yeah. it's a great outdoor strain, but that's a great outdoor strain for that environment. Let's work with what we're working with. Totally. And the, what I grabbed from him, I, I mean, I have everything, but I would really recommend the Keweenaw Copper, which, you know, this cool, it's, a, it's a Michigan name as well. Uh, so uh, what else are you working with then besides cookie strains and hemp? Like you, you want to talk strains, Let's, you, you did some breeding. So I'm really interested to see what you felt was worth trying to put some effort into and carry on the genetic lineup. Yeah, I've, I've found that... Um, these crosses that have the GMO line in them have been growing pretty well for me in my climate region and, and uh, they're just pretty resilient to you know what's going on so that's the uh, orgasmic cookies or whatever they want to call it GMO strain <laughs> um, but anyways I got a strain that it's a GMO garlic mint cross I've been working with this strain for the last three years and bred it out to a few lines and made a strain that I call funky barn now and so I'm in the process now i'm f2 in it this summer so um had it out last summer didn't i back crossed it last summer and um hunted it out over the winter and now i'm f2 in it this summer so i'm really hoping that these strains you know will be good they've been good to me so far so i'm excited to see what they'll do for me next year awesome that's awesome. good luck first of all GMO is right up my alley. It's a strain that I've been uh, getting a lot of specifically extract of because it's so different than everything else. I just love that a lot. Yeah, it's a great medicine. It's a strong medicine. It's a great medicine. Like I say, it's a, it seems to be a fairly resilient plant. The actual GMO plant wants to grow for, you know, 12 to 16 weeks. So, you know, it's a little bit tough. So it's shortening that flower time and um, you know, with the outdoor plants, if you grow a mediocre plant, it's really going to be mediocre outside. So you need a strong plant like that to, you know, so people can look at it and not know that it's an outdoor plant. That's hard to do. Yeah. Yeah, it is hard to do. But if you have the right strains and you nurse them properly, you know, I, I, I actually, like I say, I love doing it outside. I, I feel like I do much better outside myself. I played with a couple of outdoor plants for the first time this year, and I'm going to do a lot more next year, but um, I had pretty good luck. I have to trim it yet, so I don't know what the result was, but we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely cleaning. You guys see uh, how they're cleaning plants now with, like, a, what is it, a potassium sorbate and lemon wash in a five-gallon bucket of cold water, and you can dunk your plants and wash them off. I'm going to try that this year. I know some good people that are doing that. So I'm going to check it out. 
and we'll see. We'll report back on that, but <laughs> I believe in it. I know so it, you know some of the people that are doing it, and, and they wouldn't do it if it wasn't a good method. Supposedly, I have some dry. There's another product. It's called Green Clean. It's like a sorbet, and you wash your plants with that, and supposedly it'll dry in 24 hours, which is crazy. But maybe for some of these big farmers, you know, that's part of the thing, you know. Have, like I say, that's the hardest part of being a big farmer is how you're going to dry it and cure it. So learning, learning these techniques is going to be important. I have a bunch of motorcycles going past my house right now. <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, moving on this next year, we're going to be trying to hunt more hemp strains, do a better job of hunting hemp strains and having um, hemp strains available for people at our place. And, you know, I think that, you know, however many hemp farmers there were this year, there'll be more next year for sure. And, you know, you guys probably saw it was just a crapshoot for most of them. People were just running around with their tail between their legs trying to find plants and do everything they can and, and it was tough you know so uh, it, you know that's what part of the reason I'm excited to see Michigan farmers just get their stuff together more and more and more and, and take off and, and do this well. There's definitely a demand for it. Sorry, that dab's got me, man. I'm just kind of <laughs> slid from the GMO, man. I've got my yeah. Saturday siren going off and motorcycles going by, and you're just sitting there. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about this KNF a little bit. Uh, go a little bit deeper with it. I, and I, I'm sorry in advance for listeners who have never heard anything about this. It's going to come off as a little bit of an alphabet soup, but I promise you it's really worth looking into and trying to get an idea of how this works. Yeah, so KNF, um, uh, Dr. Cho from Korea um, wrote this book, Natu Korean Guide to Natural Farming, and he just basically wrote down a lot of his family recipes and, you know, old um, inherited traditions of farming and how they've used basic herbs and medicines and um, plant materials in the gardening process. You know, a big thing is, you know, if you think even just 50 years ago, there really wasn't any gardener store. You know, there wasn't even tractor supplies and stuff like that. There was, you know, a couple maybe farm supply stores here and there, but um, people had to use their own resources. You know, there wasn't chemical manufacturers mailing you bottles of stuff to put on your farm. And so farmers used to have to, you know, rely on their own lands and, and what the materials that they had around them. And so, you know, that's what Dr. Cho is uh, promoting there is just how to use this stuff. So. A lot of farmers have clicked on to that message and, and the book that he wrote and um, have taken off with it. And, you know, someone as myself with the background in the, in the brewing and the fermentation and, and gardening and geology, like I said, it just it really took off with me. But the idea is, is to take plant materials, fruit materials, um, natural bone materials, um, natural organics, um, microbes from nature, harvesting and collecting these beneficials and introducing them to your land. And so there's various products that you can make. You can make the plant juice, you can make the fruit juice, you can make calcium feeds, make the herbal nutrient supplements. Um, and so just learning how to implement this into your gardening program is, is the goal here. But overall, you know, nature should provide us everything we need if we use the proper elements. You know, we just got to find the proper organics and the proper minerals and elements and, and we got what we need. And so now we're all just trying to relearn this stuff again and, um, and try to show people how to do it. And a big part of the message is do it yourself. You know, people should set up a small garden of their own, whether they want to grow cannabis or they just want to grow some corn or some beans or something, you know, maybe whatever you want, set up a small spot in your yard and, and, and grow yourself something. Um, and it helps us not be so reliant on the big farm industry, which, you know, has obviously having some issues of its own. We've been seeing all sorts of different food outbreaks and things like that. And, you know, I, a lot of us attribute it to just 
getting lazy in our farming practices and not having this beneficial life around us and around our food that we're eating. And so the message is pretty big overall. Looking at, you know, where we're going as a, you know, this continuously growing population and just trying to sustain healthy food for people is going to be very, very important for people. So, um, learning to harvest nature and work with nature is, is important the best we can. Sorry, I'm rambling a little bit, but if you have any specific direction about um, questions about the process, I, we also make, uh, I guess I can show you guys something here real quick. I made uh, my own little poster here. I know you're not gonna be able to see much of it, but I'll just wave it across. But I kind of break down, I have a schedule in here. And so um, this schedule is developed based on social media and the people that I've been talking with around the United States and different parts of the world even and, and how we're implementing these fruits and herbs and calcium feeds and, and how we're using them in our program. And we're also learning a lot about mixing soils and making soils and uh, building our soils and uh, just full on working with nature. So this poster that I have is something that I just give out to people who, you know, buy our inputs or come in for advice. Um, I'll give them that. It also explains how you can make some of this stuff and how you use it. Um, and some different sources available. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my overall thing with uh, the natural farming is that if it does interest you and, and, you know, you think you want to make yourself a plant juice or a fruit juice or a lab feed or herbal nutrient, you know, just start with something, you know. Um, pick something that sounds interesting to you that maybe you would want to feed your plants and make a juice out of it. It's very simple. If you want to make a plant juice, you know, you take your plants, you plant, take your plant material and uh, chop it up really well and mix it with some brown sugar, put it in a bucket with a piece of parchment paper on top, let it sit for seven to 10 days and come back and you'll have some juice there. The principle's uh, a lot like uh, making a strawberry shortcake, I guess. You know, we, we take the strawberries, we mix it with sugar, we put it in the fridge overnight and we come back and it's all juiced out. So that's what we're doing with the plant materials. We're just pulling out, extracting the natural juices. And um, different plants have, are rich in calcium or potassium or silica. And so learning which plants have various nutrients, you know, we can tailor that to our plant's life cycle and, and make a dynamic feed to give our plants. And so that's what we do. We, you know, we go out and, um, you know, my plant juice feed, we, we go out and harvest all sorts of stuff throughout the national forest lands, you know, I'm finding different humphreys and nettles. Um, uh, horsetail is a big one that we go out and find. Um, I put a little bit of burr, I use a little bit of burdock, it's something that I find out there. Dandelions is super beneficial. Um, there's, there's hundreds of plants that you can use, but just finding healthy ones that are, are away from um, chemicals is you know, the main thing that you want to find them out in nature, harvest things from nature. The other thing that I do is I, I have gardens and I actually grow vegetables that I use for juices, you know, that I'm not even going to eat. I just specifically juice them. So, you know, just learning what you like and what's beneficial. Do you grow uh, a comfrey yourself or do you harvest that wild? Because that's really invasive, right? Yeah, it is. I, I have my own comfrey, um, and I know a few spots where it, where it grows wild. Um, and yeah, and then also I have a crew of people, you know, having a store, people bring me stuff too. Um, so that's very beneficial. So we, you know, every day we're chopping up stuff and breaking things down. Um, I got great big cylinders and just breaking all these plant materials down and extracting the juices. I think it's really awesome that you sell all of these products pre-made, but you really advocate that people should learn how to do this and go out and do it themselves and learn the process. You know, if there ever is a zombie apocalypse, there won't be a store to go and buy your, uh, your K&F. But you have full packages. You have harvest pack, veg pack, you know, farmer's pack, and it's all a whole schedule of nutrients just like any other regimen. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cool for people, you know, it's hard to keep up with all this stuff. If you actually decide that you want to be a 
full on um, K and F schedule like mine, and you're gonna make it all yourself, it's definitely work all year round. Like you could do it all through the summer, but it's not easy. You gotta have resources, you gotta have space, you gotta get out in nature and find some stuff or grow some stuff. You know, it's it's definitely a lot of work. And so even the people that really, really enjoy it, they run out of something here and there, you know, they run out of this and you know, they don't have another month or two to make it. And so, you know, people will reach out. And so other natural farmers are super appreciative of you know, that they can come and just grab stuff from us here and there, or just grab it all if they don't even want to bother with it, you know. Some of us have, some of us work 80 hours a week, you know, <laughs> in other jobs. You ain't, you're not going to have time for nothing. You can go home and check the plants, feed them, and go to bed. Well, let's talk about doing the microbes with the rice real quick. If, if we wanted to start real simply for somebody, uh, as a first step, everybody knows that microbes tend to be expensive to buy, but they're super, super cheap to harvest and collect. Yeah, so uh, mycelium grows all over in nature. Uh, mycelium is what breaks nature down and recycles it back to the earth. And so um, it has a lot of beneficial properties, microbes. You know, if you talk to scientists, we might even all come from microbes, you know, earliest life comes from microorganisms. So my, the microdiversity, we don't know, we don't, we can't underestimate its importance of microdiversity in our lives. And so what we do is you could go out into a native wooded area and find some nice green, wet area. Um, and you'll see that the leaf matter, maybe there's some down sticks on the ground lightly pick up some of that leaf matter and that stick matter and look underneath it and you'll see like a white fuzzy mycorrhizae growth and um, that it just latches on to the material slowly breaks it down and, and um, adds that diversity back to the land and so in order to harvest your own microbes you've got to find this mycelium in nature and bring it back and culture it and um, make a usable product out of it and the way to do that is you um you take uh, rice and you cook it halfway, just a halfway rice, not full on mushy, but halfway um, with a little bit of herbal nutrient plant juice in it. Um, stir it up, cool it off and spread it out in like an oak box. And then you um, cover that oak box with a piece of um, like paper towel, like a tougher paper towel. And you put the white mycelium mass on top of that and the mycelium will actually grow through the paper towel and culturize itself on the rice. So yeah, I'm talking a bit of lingo there, but it is pretty simple, really. You're just taking the microbes and culture it on the rice. Um, there's other ways to do it. M microbes obviously culturize on other wood matter. They culturize on, you know, if you can take like some oat chips and rice hulls, other different types of lighter material. We'll, we'll also culturize microbes. Um, but if you get a nice growth on it and you actually succeed in what you're trying to do, what you do is then mix it with a little bit of brown sugar because the microdiversity will um, stabilize itself and feed on that brown sugar. And so you take your culture and just mix it with a bit of brown sugar and store it in a jar. And um, you know, I put like a teaspoon or a tablespoon into my feed, my brewer feed. And, um, and I brew it up overnight and it culturizes in my water. And then you can feed it on your plants or you can use it as a foliar feed. But why is it important? That's a good question, right? Um, I guess I'll go there. It's important because this is what a lot of plant life is missing is microdiversity. When we use synthetics or we try to grow plants inside or we grow them in a, an, an environment that isn't completely natural, you know, it's deprived of microdiversity. And so microdiversity keeps that plant life, you know, much more um, healthy. It also is a carrier of feed to the root mass. So microbes build up around the root mass and basically tell the nutrients, come here, come here. We want to feed this plant. And so build, having that microdiversity is keeping your plant healthy and keeping your nutrients moving through your soil mass. I was uh, looking at doing an earthworm casting with, you know, if you go to like uh, 
Walmart, you can buy baby oatmeal. It's completely organic. It comes in like the sealed plastic box. I was going to take a cloning tray and I was going to put earthworm castings in that oatmeal, mix a little bit of molasses in there, wet it down, and then put my heat pad underneath of it put the lid over top and then cover that with a towel to keep it nice and dark and try that for seven days and see if I can get anything going. Yeah, that's a good way. So um, that's a good point to bring up. So another way that I culturize it is I'll, I'll mix up my soil and have my organics in there and I'll take some of that micro diversity that I've found in nature and I actually put it right on top of my soil. I'll put it in like a tote and I'll put it right on top of the soil and sprinkle rice hulls and oats around it and you know just put the lid on store it in a cool dark place and don't open it for a week come back and sometimes it's just a full mat on top there and then you it will colonize it. for sure yeah and then just mix it right in the soil and you're off and running you know you got a beautiful healthy soil this seems so easy to me dude yeah. we've been trying to convince you like since fucking kush stock and i'm not saying that this way is the only way or the best way i'm just saying if you really want to talk about frugal growing, shout out to Abolished Farms. If you really want to talk about frugal growing, let's go back to the way that we've been doing it for 8,000 years, man. It's probably cheaper before currency. Well, I mean, particularly this microbe part, because microbes are an expensive thing to add to any grow. And uh, this in particular cuts a lot of the cost, and it seems very simple. I'm one of those guys that works 80 hours a week and doesn't have a lot of time to mix up a bunch of stuff. That's one of the reasons why I'm in a synthetic environment. But I can yeah. definitely see the appeal of uh, culturing your own microbes and saving yourself $70. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, you know, we all have different interest level in, um, in NAX for it too, you know? So I would say too, we could complicate it as much as we want. You know, we can, we can all sit and drive ourselves crazy thinking about all the ins and outs. And so some people just simply don't want to do that and good for them. Because <laughs> sometimes I drive myself a little too crazy. The KNF is really cool, but as a procrastinator, it's like my worst nightmare. Everything you do, you have to plan a couple of weeks ahead or a couple of months ahead. Like, I can't even, there's no way. True, yeah. but it does last, though. That's the whole thing is once you make this FPJ, the fermented plant juice, with the brown sugar and your defoliated leaves, it's going to hold for how long is that going to keep for on my shelf? I don't have to use that immediately. It's not like a tea. No, it's easily good for a year if you keep it in a cool, dark spot. That's cool. That's good to know for sure. So, but yeah, you, you, bring up, you, you bring up the plant leaf too. And so, cannabis plant leaf. So, if, you, if you're full on vegging and you've got nice, big, beautiful, dark green fan leaves, you don't know health issues whatsoever. Those are absolutely one of the best things you could possibly ferment for your plant feed because that means that that plant is full of all the nutrients that it wants. And so if you break that down, you're just saving them nutrients for later and you can give them to your next plant growth and make sure they got everything they need. So what is the ratio that I should be using for the organic matter of leaves and versus brown sugar? Is there kind of a hard and fast rule to that? The general rule is one to one. So, you know, you would mix equal parts sugar to equal parts plant material, but you have to judge um, your plant's juiciness or you, you really want to just make sure you get a full even spread of that sugar. So you take your leaf matter, you want to chop it up really fine, you know, chop it up the best you can and mix it in and, and mix that sugar in and actually work it in for at least a minute because if you just do it for 10 seconds, it's not going to be that wet. If you, if you, work it all the way in for a minute you know you'll get a good mixture if you feel like it needs a little more sugar then you can put a little more on it's often best to put some sugar on the top of it because if it gets dry on top then it, it ruins it so you do not want it to get dry on top and there's a debate on people that people say you shouldn't use water but if you can use a little bit of like you know it's really good water like bottled water like a distilled water or whatever um Sometimes with, uh, if, the, if the material just feels a little bit too dry, giving it a spit of water in the beginning just so it has some moisture right off the bat because you, you want it to be wet, that's for sure. And, it, and it'll just slowly break down from there. Right, it's about getting the sugar to break down at first into a liquid form so that it can work on the plant matter, right? Just like you were talking about the strawberries. I think that's a great analogy, by the way. 
Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly what we're doing, really. Um, salts can also pull sugar or liquids out. So sometimes I also buy natural uh, sea salts and salt, put just like a pinch of that in there sometimes. Um, not in everything, but sometimes I do that because that'll also pull more sugar out. That's a new one. I haven't heard that one. Thank you. Love learning yeah. something new. Yeah, and well, speaking of the salts too, just harvesting uh, raw crystal salt from the oceans. You know, you want to be a salt grower. That's how you do it. So I use, I, I put, I put, <laughs> I take actual ocean salts and I put that in my water throughout my flower cycle, and that's where my salts come from. The geologist in you had to get that in, didn't you? <laughs> For sure. Yeah, you know, just working. I understand the minerals and the organics and, and I just want to work with them as best as I can and, and try to show other people because I've been very encouraged by, you know, like I say, some of these other people that have been doing it longer than me and, and, and have showed me the way um, and just helping each other. I, you know, I got a pretty good following on, on social media. So we've been chatting for years, you know, a lot of us natural farmers. And so we've been just learning this process together, bouncing ideas, you know, we used to just send each other samples of stuff like here, check this out here, check this out, you know, and it kind of took off and I just decided, Hey, uh, I got the skills to make this on a bigger quantity, but never do I intend to supply any, any, any portion of this world necessarily just keeping up with a, you know, small, small following, small demand is my, is my goal. You know, once I have to make over 50 gallons of something, then I'm going to stop. Probably. <laughs> Maybe. Exactly. We'll see. It's hard to keep up. You know, I'm a busy man. I, I work, I run a business, I run a farm. So it's, it's a constant struggle for me too. I keep some good people around me and keep it moving. Yeah, like you said, you had the skills to literally pay the bills. You got a website and a storefront now and all that stuff. You should be really proud of your progress in the, uh, the cannabis world for sure. In the K and F world too. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, it's you know, it's a passion. I always say you got do it, do what makes you happy in life, right? Find your passion. You know, I had this education. I've I've worked professionally as an environmental engineer, um, and now this is all legal. You know, I don't have to necessarily hide behind the behind my my four walls anymore. I can I can talk about this, and I can still be a professional. There's nothing wrong with it, you know. And all of us can, you know, there's no shame in being a professional and, and being involved in cannabis in, industry as well. Yeah, we like to say that we break the lazy stoner stereotype around here because we, you know, founded a show and, you know, you founded a place of work and all of that stuff. Everyone we talk to is doing something. We're not all smoking and sitting in front of a TV. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I do that some days too, but um, as long as you don't do it every day, you can break that stereotype, you know. Yeah. You can be a smoker, just get your shit done. Exactly. I also want to say thanks because your website actually is really a good resource itself just for information, not just for merchandise. So, dude, you're really, really giving back to the community. And time is a premium for you, obviously, between the hemp garden, your regular garden, the storefront, family life, old lady. I mean, wow. That's, that's, that's your passion showing right there, brother. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, it's cool. It's, 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 it's a privilege to do what I'm able to do right now. You know, uh, I would have never envisioned it. We all grew up, um, some punk ass kids just having fun, you know what I mean? And, and now, now we get the privilege to go out and, and live our lives freely <laughs> and don't have to be a punk ass kid anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I love that. I guess my last question for you is, is there anything that you want to make sure that you say before we get off of here? Is there anything that you would regret not talking about before we're done? Mm. We always are willing to do another part two. We just did a part two last night with Abolish Farms because he told us that we forgot to do his introduction when we did the first video. We got, he got overzealous and we got right into the topic. So that's why I made a point to do this with you. And I don't want you to walk away and go, ah, oh, Man, I wish I really would have thought to say something about this. We still have our shout outs and stuff, but uh, definitely, man, this is your time. Okay. I guess that, you know, what comes to mind is fairly simple is I'm trying to learn what people want to learn about out there too, you know. Um, I obviously can share various knowledge with people of what, what's going on. Um, 
you know, things from pest management strategies to gardening strategies. Do people want to learn how to actually do and make this stuff themselves? Um, soil health, mixing soils, things like that. So, you know, you guys got a cool following. So, uh, you know, if we get a chance to talk again, I would like to know what people think, you know, what the feedback is and what people are interested in learning more about. Um, because I'm, you know, that's, that's, that's my passion is just, you know, help people out. So, um, you know, I'm always here to, for people to reach out to and, and I enjoy getting out there. I've been, this last year has been really hectic, obviously. Like you said, I got so much on my plate. So it's just finding time to sit down and talk. And, um, but moving into this winter, I, that's kind of my focus is to just outreach, you know what I mean? And talk to people and um, figure out exactly what this community is looking for and how I can help them. Well, we'll have, yeah, we'll have to get you onto our live show so you can talk to uh, our chat and they can just ask you questions directly. Okay. Yeah, you have you have a standing open invitation to that. Any time that you want to join Sunday nights, 9 till 11, just pop in, even if it's just to say, hey, man, that we'd love to have you because you're a font of information, man. So, like, this has really been enjoyable. And I know we're just barely scratching the surface here. There's a lot more that we can get into. Yeah, I kind of bounced all over and addressed a bunch of topics. So, you know, we'll see what people are excited to learn more about and we'll take it off from there, you know. But we're not going anywhere. There's Country Roots is here to stay this year for sure. If at the end of next year, life sucks, and maybe I'll just move on and be a professional engineer again. But for now, um, we're off and running. And, and I don't have any reason to believe that this isn't going to work out for us because we've people are really appreciating it. And it um, seems like we can't really do enough sometimes and or get enough places or talk to enough people. So let's just keep it going. I agree. You've got a lot of knowledge, and I really appreciate you sharing it with us and our listeners and people that will view this. Um, is there anybody that you want to give shout outs to in the community? You know, um, yeah, I guess, you know, just I got some good people working for me. They don't necessarily have a big following, or, you know, or a lot of my people aren't necessarily out there, but Sudden Sense Cultivations on Instagram, my boy Cameron. Um, my wife and um, our friend Jenny and Pants work for us and, you know, uh, various friends of ours, the Blue Door MI and um, uh, Hardwoods Hemp Co. Um, you know, we got, we're, we're working with some good people here and we all have a similar goal and um, just trying to, trying to do what we can. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it's been great. It's been great to be a part of this community and I'm glad to be on your guys' show, and I hope to be back for sure. That's what it takes. It takes a badass team to do that. That's what we have on our show, and I think that's what you'll see. If you join us on our panel some Sunday at 9 o'clock. Yeah, absolutely. Like I say, things are slowing down for me. We'll, we'll get through this harvest, and, um, yeah, I'd love to come back. Let's, let's see what kind of feedback we get, and we'll, we'll, we'll plan something out for the next time. I promise you people will love this. Skilbo, what do you think? I think I've had a blast, man, and I can't wait to not only get him on the live stream so that we can have people smarter than us asking him questions, but so that we can get him in these chat that we have rolling every single day, man, because I really feel like you're just, you're one of us, man. I'm really glad to have you as a guest and as a community member. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it, brother. You got a new angle, my friend. Wonderful. You guys are awesome. You rock. And with that, you've been listening to the Michigan Bros Grow Show.